You're dusting off your vinyl collection and you've realized that some of your old favorites might not last forever. You could buy a new copy of an old record and it might come with a download code. But don't do that. You've already bought it once. You don't need to buy it again. That's just silly. Don't be silly. <laughs> just make the MP3s yourself with the help of Sound Studio 4. It's the latest version of Sound Studio from Felt Tip Inc. It's got everything you need to record, edit, and adjust your audio for just about any project. Like podcasting, digitizing your records, creating sound effects, recording music, pretty much anything you can think of, it'll work for you. You can find Sound Studio 4 in the Mac App Store or at macsoundstudio.com. And get to throwing away your old records. <laughs> Wait, don't do that. Ignition sequence start. Five. Everything. Three. Everything. Sounds. Sounds. This is Everything Sounds. I'm Craig Chank. And I'm George Drake Jr. This is Everything Sounds. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound. A dimension of sight. A dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. You might know the story of Henry Bemis, even if that name doesn't sound familiar to you right now. Witness Mr. Henry Bemis, a charter member in the fraternity of dreamers. A bookish little man whose passion is the printed page, but who is conspired against by a bank president and a wife and a world full of tongue cluckers and the unrelenting hands of a clock. Episode 8 of Season 1 of The Twilight Zone tells the story of a man who wants time, silence, and solitude to just read his books. Well, long story short, Mr. Bemis goes into the bank vault during his lunch break where he can read without interruption. He's knocked unconscious all of a sudden from an explosion. And when he wakes up, he finds that he's alone after surviving a nuclear war attack. Alone, except for his books. Books! Books! All the books I'll need! All the books! All the books I'll ever want! Shelley, Shakespeare, Shaw... He's sitting on the steps of what used to be his local library. He's made stacks and organized all of his books. January, February, March... He's already planning what he's going to read tomorrow, next week, next year, and even beyond that. And the best thing, the very best thing of all, is there's time now. Time, time, time. Ah, there's time enough at last. He has his books, all the time in the world, and when he leans over to pick up a book, his glasses fall from his face and shatter on the ground. That's not fair. That's not fair at all. If that episode were rewritten in today's world, Mr. Bemis would likely have the same things keeping him from his books, but they may have been amplified by technology. Maybe his email notifications from work or texts from his wife would interrupt his reading. Well, today we want to consider how technology can lead some people to crave solitude and silence, as well as find out more about a thought experiment that developed some hypothetical solutions. But first, we need to meet these two guys. Hello, my name is uh, Chris Wapkin. Hello, my name is Daniel Gottemeyer. Given that we're talking about technology, the way that they met is pretty fitting, actually. So um, Chris and I both went to the same program at the Royal College of Art in London, the Design Interaction Program. And although we didn't meet in time, like we didn't meet in London during that time, um, I think we met through Facebook originally, right? Yeah. So because we were both in New York, Chris messaged me and um, yeah. Thanks to Facebook, we're now friends and collaborators in many ways. Their conversations developed into some creative ideas about patterns and behavior in public spaces, networked cities, data, and technology. As they were sharing their ideas, New York City debuted its digital roadmap, which outlined the city's agenda for making the city more connected. They were going to do it through things like broadband and Wi-Fi access, design and computer science education initiatives, 
and plenty of other color-coded slices of different pie charts and checklists in the report. This document caught Daniel and Chris's attention, and they started considering some of the implications of living in a hyper-connected city. And I think we were, like, wondering a little bit, you know, that is like one angle of how cities will develop more connectivity and more you know, connections for their citizens. But what would be, like, how, how would cities have the responsibility not only to connect their citizens, but also reflectively look at what comes with it and what are the behavioral implications and how, you know, kind of like, I think maybe in a way, develop a little bit more like a reflective point of view around that hyper-connected city that, that they're talking about. In 2012, they began a thought experiment that they named the Office for Hypothetical Futures. Their stated goals were to create a framework for the research, exploration, and development of these parallel near-future stories. They create awareness, raise issues, prompt questions, and facilitate discussions around the impending digitization of our world. Within the Office for Hypothetical Futures, they took things a step further. Chris and Daniel created a fictional department of the city of New York that they called NYC Foresight. Right, so what we're trying to do is like um, create a framework, and the framework is basically sort of around the aesthetics of using what the, the gra graphic language that the city actually uses and sort of the visual, using the visual language in, in all sorts of di different ways. For example, their website features pictures of official-looking street signs and application forms. Their goal was to develop a narrative about alternative ways that the city could provide services in our increasingly digital future. And once you see them in the language that the city communicates, like we're trying to create this uh, point of um, suspension of disbelief. Some of the Foresight Department's initiatives include a GPS signal detour where you could apply to have your GPS tell people that you are going to do something more constructive than going to a bar, like let's say a yoga studio or a walk in the park, for example. They also came up with a concept where the department would keep your data trail perfect by tweaking the records of things that you've purchased. And of course, we are most interested in their ideas about sound, or in their case, silence. Much of our connectedness involves increased noise, mostly from cell phone technology. The NYC Foresight Department website has application forms to allow people to make a request for a silent bench. The silent bench program is made to seem like those real programs where parks allow you to adopt a bench, and then you have a mini plaque with your name on the bench. And that is where the silent part of all of it comes in. We are we are interested in creating these these bubbles and uh, like in a way like if you thinking about the silent bench like that's basically like uh, um, a bench that sends out um, white noise on like the data signal so there's no no connectedness or it blocks the connectedness. Some of their ideas about silence and cell phones were inspired by local bars and coffee shops that have made their own signs encouraging people not to use their cell phones while they're in the building. It's kind of a courtesy to other guests, and it encourages that face-to-face -face interaction. They take that cell phone silence idea further with their proposal for proximity jammers. These proximity jammers would stop incoming and outgoing cell phone calls on certain blocks at night. These ideas are all a part of what they've called the Digital Serenity Initiative. The NYC Foresight Department has forms for all of these programs that people can download, fill out, and send in. Once it becomes that real that you actually can fill out a form and request these things, then um, people, yeah, that's the suspension of disbelief that people are like, okay, these things are um, actually great. I really want to have this. Of course, their goal really isn't to implement these ideas, but rather to gather narratives about why people might want these services and how these stories fit into the idea of a highly connected city. They've been collecting forms, but they've also held office hours to meet with people in person 
including at New York's Festival of Ideas in May of 2013. Maybe you want to talk about it. Eh? Um, I think it's like, I mean, I think one thing that, that you know, when we did this, um, the office hours at the Festival of Ideas, I think it's like those things that we s- try to address with the licenses and with the department, I think everybody can relate to quite easily because everybody knows those moments or knows also, even if you're not consciously aware of it or you can't really pinpoint it sometimes, but I think those kind of stresses and anxieties that we're talking about, everybody to a smaller or bigger extent knows through the use of that technology. So it might seem that NYC Foresight focuses on negatives of technology, including noise in public spaces and data collection. However, the aim of the project isn't about whether things are good or bad, but instead, it's a thought starter. It's about the way that things are and the way that they might be. Tying it back to Mr. Bemis from earlier, technology's influence is related to how it's used. Henry Bemis thought of people as distractions from his books, but really the books were distracting him from his life. We never find out the specifics of what happened to Henry after his glasses break, but we can imagine that he might have eventually realized that even a healthy habit can do harm when it's taken to extremes. In the same way, our gadgets can disconnect us from people or encourage other negative consequences if we let them. Much like Mr. Bemis's broken glasses, NYC Foresight might be the thing we need to reconsider our own choices and outlook. This thought experiment allows us to think about our own use of technology, but also to realize that technology does often have very tangible benefits. Communication can go through all sorts of like different channels. I don't think like, well, if you like start using technology, like there's like enables you to tell the same story, but like through a different like channel. I don't think that really. Um, I think the the very fundamental needs that we as humans have are, you know, have somewhat stayed the same throughout throughout that that time. And I think it's not it's not it's not a question of like, you know good or bad, or this is bad or this is good. It's just like it changes how we communicate. We have links where you can find out more about Chris and Daniel, as well as the Office for Hypothetical Futures and NYC Foresight at everythingsounds.org. While you're there, check out our episode archive, and you can find the link to subscribe to the show on iTunes and Stitcher. And after you listen to a few episodes, be sure to write a review on iTunes. It turns out that it actually really helps shows climb in the rankings. So we'd appreciate if you take a minute to just follow the link at everythingsounds.org and write a review. Today's episode was sponsored by Sound Studio 4 from Felt Tip Inc. Sound Studio 4 for Mac lets you record audio, create podcasts, digitize tapes and records, and create sound effects for your own projects. Information on all of the features at macsoundstudio.com or in the Mac App Store. Again, that's Sound Studio 4 for Mac. Everything Sounds is a part of the Mule Radio Syndicate. You can find other Mule shows like Here Be Monsters, Decode DC, and The Broad Experience at muleradio.com. And luckily, none of the Mule Radio shows are hypothetical. (laughs) No, they're all very real shows. But do you think that NYC Foresight would let us develop some sort of hypothetical radio programming for New York City? I don't think the average New Yorker would have a problem with everything sounds all day, every day. (laughs) Oh, I think that would just be too much. People would probably retreat into bank vaults just to get away from our voices. Henry Bemis, the small man in the glasses who wanted nothing but time. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, thanks for listening to Everything Sounds. I'm Craig Shank. And I'm Henry Bemis. George Drake Jr. (laughs) (laughs) You idiot.